everybody. Thank you so much for your patience. We just had a few technical difficulties that we had to overcome, but we seem to be in business now, John. Are we? Wonderful. Great. So welcome to the Institute for Advanced Legal Studies. My name is Norani Lejan. I'm Director of the Information Law and Policy Centre. I know some of you have signed up to our mailing list already, and I know some of you follow us online as well, but if you don't, please do sign up and follow us on Twitter as well. Since I have your attention before we kick off this evening, I hope you can all join us on the 22nd of November for our annual conference on digital rights and Brexit. The draft program has been posted to our website and it's free to attend. We just need registration numbers so we can get a sufficient number of nipples and wine for the day. So I hope you can all join us for that. Now it's my very great pleasure to introduce our interdisciplinary expert panel for this evening to talk about the topic of to blockchain or not to blockchain implications for data protection law. So our lead speaker this evening is Dr. John Sheridan. John is digital director of the National Archives where he is responsible for all of its digital services. Prior to this role, John was head of legislation services at the National Archives where he led the team responsible for creating and quite crucially, John, updating the legislation.gov.uk website, which on behalf of all lawyers, we are eternally grateful, especially with Brexit around the corner. John also serves on the UK's Government Open Standards Board, which sets data standards for use across government. He was also an early pioneer of open data and remains active in that community. Our second very eminent speaker this evening is Professor Christopher Millard. Christopher is head of the Cloud Legal Project since 2009 within the Centre for Commercial Law, Service, Commercial Law Studies excuse me, at Queen Mary University of London. He's also a research associate at the Oxford Internet Institute and is a counsel to the law firm Bristos. He has over 30 years experience in technology law and policy, both in academia and legal practice. Christopher has published very widely in computer law and is a founding editor of the International Journal of Law and Information Technology Journal and of International Data Privacy Law, both published by Oxford University Press. In terms of the format for this evening, John will present for approximately 30 minutes. Yeah. 30 minutes. And then we'll have Christopher's contribution to follow. After that, we will have the wine reception, as you can see in the back, which I hope you can all stay and join us for. So I'd like to thank our speakers for coming this evening and for you for joining us also. And I'd now like to invite John to present his paper on tamper-proofing video archives using blockchain technology. Yeah. So, um, thank you, Nora. And thank everyone for uh, making, it, making it here this evening. Um, just so you get a sense for uh, what my day job looks like, um, my portfolio at the National Archives covers our work as a digital archive. Um, so this involves transferring new digital records from government departments, preserving those records and making them available, and also a variety of digital services that we provide. Our main website, um, where you can search our catalogue. Um, we also provide um, public access to legislation on legislation as I was referred to, more of that to come a little bit. Um, and um, we run um, the UK government web archive and we also are responsible for publishing the Gazette. Now each of these services, in one guise or another, um, has connections with questions to do with privacy and data protection. What's the legal basis for us doing this? What do we need to consider when we're handling this information? So dealing with issues around GDPR is, uh, is a day-to-day -day concern, both for my organisation and for me and my work. The National Archives is a non-ministerial government department, so I'm a civil servant. We're also an independent research organisation, and that means that we can um, work um, very closely with um, uh, universities and other academic organisations on um, uh, funded research projects. And our investigation into blockchain um, is very much um, a story of um, academic funded research into a new technology and working through the implications of that for archives. Now, 
this can work. Come on, computer. <laughs> let's try that one. No, let's try that. Hey! There's a brilliant moment. For, you know, one of the wonderful things about working in an archive is you get to look back a long way, you get to look forward a long way. There's a brilliant moment in 1860, I don't know how many of you know this, where Charles Dickens, um, he's had some bad press. He's split from his wife and he makes the decision that he's going to burn his letters and he has a bonfire where he literally burns 20 years of his correspondence. He gets the kids to help him. Um, uh, his younger daughter's very upset about what's being lost. Um, we think, we don't know, because the letters were burnt, um, that there were letters from Wilkie Collins, George Eliot, William Makepeace Thackeray, but Dickens decides for himself, for whatever reason, to eradicate the evidence. Now, there is no doubt that <laughs> scholars would be reading and using those letters. <coughs> so this question of what's recorded and what's kept and by who, and what's recorded by individuals and the rights that we have in the present to make decisions about what's kept and by whom, and what's recorded by institutions has long been at play. <coughs> Dickens, in the middle of the 19th century, was able to make a very big and positive decision about what he wanted to be remembered. And he decided it's all going up in flames. And now it's interesting to think in this digital era quite what it would take. I suspect more than just kind of, you know, getting your kids to help you out for an afternoon and bring out the boxes of letters um, uh, to eradicate um, uh, your personal records in the way that Dickens was able to do. Now this is interesting because obviously government doesn't work like this. Um, for lots of reasons, um, we keep public records, and for lots of reasons, information about people finds itself in the public record. Now, um, we as an organisation um, uh, are bound by GDPR, um, and here's um, Article 5, to, um, mainly this is an opportunity to um, highlight that you can now go to legislation.gov.uk, find the European legislation that um, come exit day um, uh, will be incorporated into UK domestic legislation and also find out if the UK is making any prospective changes to that legislation. But Article 5, um, which will be retained <coughs> and retitled as the United Kingdom Data Protection Regulation, um, sets out very clearly the principles that relate to processing of personal data. But for public records, well, who decides? Um, we operate under um, quite an elderly act, going way, way back to 1958, um, and it sets up a regime in government where record creators, people in government departments, make decisions about what information has historical value, um, historical public records, and that decision-making will either be for those records administrative value or for their historical significance, their historical value. So record creators make decisions and they do that under the guidance of the Keeper of Public Records, basically my boss. Um, access is provided for under the Freedom of Information Act and there's a statutory code of practice under the Freedom of Information Act um, that gives guidance to record creators about how they should manage their information and also how um, they should make arrangements for passing it to the National Archives or one of the designated places of deposit for long-term preservation and access. Now, it's interesting if the record creators are making decisions about what gets kept, how the archive then conceives of the value it provides. Um, and this is by way of 
um, equipping you for appreciating our interest in blockchain. Um, now we provide, as an archive capital A, quite a lot of value. We preserve digital records. That means essentially understanding the risks to those digital objects through time and making decisions about which of those risks we intervene to mitigate. A classic intervention may be taking some content in one format and turning it into a different format that might be easier for us to present. We contextualise records so you know what they are evidence of. We present records so people have access to them um, and we enable use of our collection and for our digital collection. Use can be extracting some of the value of processing the records in aggregate as well as the value in terms of seeing an individual record or an individual object. So the archive provides quite a lot of value and when we're looking at something like blockchain it's pretty clear that blockchain isn't the answer to long-term preservation or to contextualization or to presentation or particularly to enabling use in terms of the value that we provide. So we're not in a situation where we're worrying that um, uh, our value proposition is going to be fundamentally disrupted uh, by blockchain. And as we go about providing that value, um, from a GDPR perspective, we are given um, a derogation. So um, Article 89, um, and again, um, a little plug for legislation for gov.uk as I'm here, um, you can view Article 89 as it currently applies. You can also um, get details about the UK amendments to Article 89 um, under the changes to legislation box. Anyhow, Article 89 um, uh, is important for archives because it creates for archiving purposes in the public interest a derogation. Now, in practice at the National Archives, we can point to the legal basis for our data processing. And rarely, if at all, do we find ourselves relying on um, Article 89 um, and um, how the UK has taken advantage of Article 89 in the Data Protection Act 2018. We can generally point to a specific legal basis for our data processing in terms of our work. Um, we are not the UK's only archive, um, and Article 89 um, is important for archives generally in terms of their um, processing of personal data. Okay, so... Um, <coughs> Archives, GDPR, where does blockchain fit into this? Um, you might be asking. Well, blockchain's very interesting. Um, for an archivist, it's a record-keeping technology. So we um, are interested in the record-keeping business and we're always curious about how people are making records and we're interested in how we might preserve those records for posterity and we're interested especially where record-keeping technologies are being picked up by government departments and being used. Um, what kind of novel public record might be chosen as part of the historical public record created using blockchain? We have pretty good evidence that registers um, are exactly the kind of thing that get chosen and passed to the archive and are very interesting for people to look at. Our archive is full of all sorts of registers. So things that look like um, they're doing the same kind of work as registers are very interesting for us. We also observe that immutable storage is becoming a thing. So ways in which you can store data and have some assurance that the information hasn't been changed is becoming a, um, an increasing part of particularly what cloud vendors are offering 
Um, so here is um, Amazon Web Services, and they're protecting data with Amazon S3 Object Lock. And they provide you with two levels of guarantee in terms of your immutable storage. Um, they give you a, a compliance level and a governance level. And it's very clear they're aiming this stuff at um, primarily financial or healthcare sectors. Um, so they're aiming to provide services um, to companies who are often trying to fulfill regulatory requirements. Now the archivist in me, thinking about mitigation of risk and management of risk over time, thinks to himself, well, this is all great. I can have my immutable storage as part of my storage, but what happens when I want to move my stuff out of S3? Hmm. All the same, it's an interesting development. So we've been researching the application and use of blockchain in our context. Um, specifically, um, we've been very fortunate to work with um, colleagues at the University of Surrey, um, and in particular Professor John Colomos, who um, uh, is in the Centre for Vision and Speech and Signal Processing at the University of Surrey, and with the Open Data Institute, to try out for real where blockchain may add value for an archive and how it may fit in our world. Now, um, <coughs> blockchain, from a certain point of view, is just a way of storing some data. The bits that are interesting for us is um, it potentially provides a way of guaranteeing the provenance of data through its immutability. It's also interesting as a model because it's decentralized. There's no central authority who is controlling the ledger. Now, um, there's kind of a capital B, B blockchain, so you can imagine the blockchain that's used um, by Bitcoin. Um, I'm tending to talk about lowercase b blockchain, so other kinds of distributed ledger. Now, what's interesting for us is it's possible to hash or fingerprint content. In fact, it can be any content. Uh, most typically, the content that we see hashed or added to a blockchain will be a record of a transaction like a financial transaction, but it's possible to hash and put onto a blockchain pretty much any content you like. And your content evidence is assured through the linking of blocks that are kind of cryptographically connected together. Now the interesting bit with a blockchain is um, how do the blocks get created and linked? What's the model for doing that? And there are different models that people use. Um, for the cryptocurrencies, then the model is based on proof of work, essentially um, people racing to solve mathematical puzzles. Um, and receiving some reward and incentive through mining. And we very quickly, um, not least because of environmental considerations, and we care a lot about sustainability in digital archiving, um, uh, figured out that that probably wasn't a brilliant model for archives. Um, and so we've been exploring a model based on um, proof of authority, um, different kind of model for creating and linking blocks. Now, um, in the Archangel project, and you can um, watch uh, a kind of fun five-minute video at your leisure um, if you go to archangel.ac.uk, um, we talk about the things that attracted our interest in blockchain. So we're interested in being able to demonstrate the authenticity of the records held by the archive. In particular, we're concerned about being able to demonstrate the authenticity of records that are passed to us, closed, and by closed I mean, um, if you asked us for the record, we can point to one or several exemptions under the Freedom of Information Act for why we're not going to give you access to the record. 
particularly in the case where we are holding records close for quite long periods of time. And lo and behold, the main reason why we'll be holding records closed for long periods of time will be because of data protection issues. So the vast majority of records, and we have records of the archive with a closure period of over 90 years, are closed principally because of the issues around um, managing privacy and data protection. And we want to demonstrate when someone passes, passes a digital record to us and we hold it closed, that when the record is eventually made open, it is what we claim it to be. So we imagine taking the record, writing one of these hashes, these fingerprints to a blockchain when we first receive it, time passes, eventually the record is made available for people to see, they can recompute the fingerprint, compare the fingerprint, and because the blockchain can't have been changed and because lots of other people have got copies of the blockchain, that's how it works, you can be assured that the archive hasn't been messing about with the record in the meantime. We're interested in immutability, the non-changing nature of the blockchain that allows you to get that kind of guarantee. And we're interested in the transparency that comes with the blockchain because the information in our model is available. People can see the hashes of the records that we're making available. So the video talks a little bit more about that. Um, in our research, we, um, we thought it was important to try this for real with other national archives and digital archivists. So we created using the Ethereum software, um, essentially a package that um, archives could install so they would be a node on a blockchain just of national archives. And the archives are all able to do sealing of the blocks. And when blocks are added to this archival blockchain, all of the archives are holding and making available a complete record of the whole ledger. <coughs> so the idea is, in this model, that if you like, the world's national archives are starting to underscore the authenticity, not just in their own collections, but in each other's, by using a technological means. Essentially, the immutability and the distribution of the blockchain. Now, why might archives be worried about underscoring each other's collections? Well, we do know that archives from time to time will be at risk um, in the world. There will be archives where the physical archive will have people turn up with AK-47s and start destroying evidence. So we know that archives hold inconvenient truths sometimes. Um, and we care about how we, um, how we demonstrate the efficacy, authenticity of the information that we're providing. Now, at the National Archives, we're also interested in how we, um, because we're managing preservation risks over time, we're interested in how we demonstrate the authenticity of quite complex digital objects. Um, in particular, objects where we imagine in order to deal with preservation risk, we're going to be intervening to change how the information is encoded over time so that the information can be read and understood in the future. And we're worry, we worry a lot about um, the rise of synthetic content. The ability that using new forms of artificial intelligence and deep networks that seems to be at play where almost anything that can be created by a human being can be synthesized by a computer. Um, especially striking the deep fake algorithm. And our project was one of those things I never thought I'd find myself um, associated with a project that appeared on Fox News. Um, uh, can anything protect us from deep fakes? Um, now, at the National Archives, we do have some important video records. Um, in particular, we have the video recordings of the 
Supreme Court, that we preserve for posterity. And when we started the Archangel Project, I always thought, could you imagine a more like, boring video collection? <laughs> because essentially, not that much um, changes. So it was a surprise for me um, to suddenly find, well, at least according to my Twitter stream, that video records of the Supreme Court um, uh, look like you know, the hottest game in town and that you are indeed perhaps onto something. Um, thinking about not just preserving these records, uh, but wanting to demonstrate their authenticity um, in the long run. Um, so, what we were able to do was fuse essentially an adaptation of the kind of technology that's being used for faking videos and using the same approach, and they're called deep, net, um, deep networks, or neural networks, using essentially the same approach, constructing a fingerprint for the content that the video contains, that's not a representation of the sequence of noughts and ones, it's a representation of the inherent video content. Um, and then put those content fingerprints onto the blockchain. Um, now, um, in Archangel, what you then have, and this is our model for how you might use content fingerprinting um, in combination with an archival distributed ledger. Um, and this is the point, this is really research. Um, this is not something that we are doing live today. Um, but it's a thing that we've made and run with a bunch of the world's archives. Um, so it's not pie in the sky, it's real work. Um, that we can put both the content evidence and some evidence of the algorithm, the deep network, mm -hmm. into the blockchain. Now this question of what is the information that you write to the blockchain is massive. Absolutely massive. And part of our trial was exploring different levels of um, uh, essentially metadata about objects that we were willing to put on the blockchain um, and trying out with other archives, seeing how people felt about putting different levels of metadata. Um, in the event, um, I think collectively we felt, even at the level of writing a file name, um, it was too much. So we've ended up in a place where, um, essentially, say for these hashes, um, we're reasonably cautious about writing much more to a blockchain. And the reason for that is um, because of some of the decision-making that we need to do around mediation and access. Now, um, in the case of our video records, we are clearly not writing. The video records of the Supreme Court as they're filmed are huge files, <coughs> so multi-terabyte files. Um, so we're not writing the records to the blockchain. We're just writing a relatively small amount of information, um, the content hash and the hash for the model onto the blockchain. Mm. Does this work? Um, so, um, uh, again, for our research project, we had a lot of fun essentially trying to tamper with our own records. Um, uh, and um, you can almost imagine like, kind of setting up a red team and a blue team to see, well, can the red team um, come up with ways of manipulating? Um, and these are all with the video records of the Supreme Court. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can we splice out pieces of content and reorder it? Can we change the soundtrack? Um, we found um, that this kind of content fingerprinting um, could detect um, tampering, including when we re-encoded the source video into quite a wide variety of different lower um, 
for like lower resolution formats. Um, so this is interesting for us because it does look like um, a way of hashing this kind of complex content. Although we are left with a problem about where, where do we want the false positives? Do we want things that haven't been tampered with occasionally to show up wrongly that they've been tampered with using this kind of methodology or vice versa? And, it's like, uh, uh, uh. Um, and again, archives have quite a lot to think about as we move into this world of, um, of tamper-proofing content that can survive format migrations as part of um, a digital preservation action. Without blockchain, I'm not sure we would even have thought that this might be a thing that we'd want to investigate or do because of the immutability. We also worry practically about scalability. Um, so, um, um, six archives, like, it does take quite a long time um, for you to complete a transaction with the blockchain. So you set your distributed ledger up amongst your archives. Imagine you're ingesting records into your archive. It's taken over 30 seconds for the hash to be written. If it's 30 seconds times all of the records I'm trying to ingest, um, well, you've broken my archive, right? I need to, I can't have one object per 30 seconds. So um, uh, Archangel was a really good opportunity for us to, to try using the Ethereum software and proof of authority. Um, and lo and behold, we found that um, it does scale reasonably well. We also talked to our colleagues um, so the trial was with the archive, the National Archives of the United States, Norway, Estonia, uh, and Australia. And the feedback from archivists was really interesting. Um, people liked the technology, particularly amongst digital archivists. There is a concern that just sitting and relying on institutional authority as the basis of trust in the records may not be enough, may not be enough. Frankly, our colleagues were mainly glad that we were doing the research because it's a new technology and in our centre um, we had no practical experience of deploying it or using it. Um, we're in the process of documenting our findings and we're coming to a point where um, essentially we'll be laying down um, a little bit of a gauntlet to our fellow national archives, a kind of we will if you will. Um, you can't run a distributed ledger on your own. Um, so um, uh, we'll discover what appetite there is um, for moving in this direction probably sometime over, over the next year. But using blockchain in this way still begs some questions. Think back to the value that the archive provides. Preservation, context, what is this record evidence of? Who made it? What were they doing? That kind of information much harder to deal with than just writing hashes to a blockchain, something that a blockchain doesn't necessarily deal with. Um, the world of record keeping, um, I think, is beautifully summed up by Magritte's The Treachery of Images. He sets up this three-way contradiction between um, a pipe is a physical thing, a visual representation of a pipe and the word pipe. None of, like, neither the word pipe nor the image pipe is a pipe. The minutes of the meeting are not the meeting. So we can assure that the digital records that we are preserving haven't been changed using technologies like blockchain. We can even do it for complex objects using content hashing. But the context of the record is still key to understanding its evidential value. A 
again, you're left with this question, how much to write to the blockchain in terms of context? And what are the risks? So some conclusions. Well, blockchain is not an archive. It's not a replacement for archives, let alone a capital A national archive. <coughs> the value that we deliver and the work that we do um, is quite a bit richer and more complex than that. The rise of synthetic content means that the landscape that we're operating in is moving quickly. And it's important that we research new technologies and understand what value they might add to us as we go about our work. And Archangel's good evidence that we can combine these new technologies in ways that do help underscore the record. And there could be some important benefits. For archives, it does supplement the institutional trust that is underscoring the record with a technological addition. There is a cryptographic assurance as well as the archives claim. And through distributed ledger technology, through blockchain, there is an opportunity for archives to collaborate together to underscore trust in each other's collections that feels timely and exciting. However, careful decision making, very careful decision making, is required about what you write on a blockchain. <coughs> and when you write it, and research is vital, and of course, because it's a research project, further work is needed, in particular, <laughs> on standardization and on implementation. Thank you very much for your time. I'm going to be able to skip or move quickly through some of my slides because you've already um, covered them so uh, well. Uh, what I want to talk about um, is the uh, application of law in a regulatory sense to the use of blockchain in various contexts, not just um, archives. And to, to narrow it down further, a specific example I'll focus on is data protection law and um, GDPR, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, some cases more familiar than you'd like to be uh, with it. So um, two things you may have heard about uh, blockchain, um, particularly in the context of things like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Uh, people say blockchain uh, in general and cryptocurrencies in particular are unregulated. And maybe they are, and this is a clunky word, unregulatable. So the law maybe can't cope with this type of technology because there are too many actors, they're too distributed. So the model that, that John's outlined is, is a, a group of, a small group of known participants who have rules that they agree with each other. But of course, something like Bitcoin is the other end of the spectrum. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, how that works in a moment of why it's, it's not a great model for most things. Um, and the other thing you, you may have heard about is the idea that processing personal data using blockchain technologies is fundamentally incompatible with GDPR. And I'll give you a quote in a minute of um, uh, a fairly eminent um, legislator or participant in the legislative process who said exactly that. So, um, interestingly, this idea that it's beyond the law is very exciting to cyber libertarians. And, you know, live free or mine, how libertarians fell in love with Bitcoin or, or here. Uh, go ahead, pass laws. They can't kill Bitcoin even if they try. Now, actually, um, we've been here before, and some of us in the room have been doing technology law or computer law, as Michael and I called it in the early 80s, uh, for a long time. Um, so uh, here's, here's one of my favorite quotes on this theme. Uh, governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel. You have no sovereignty where we gather. Your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us. They are based on matter, and there is no matter here. Now, who said that? John Perry Barlow. Fantastic. It was John Perry Barlow. And in what context did John Perry Barlow say that? It was in his uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation document. In fact, I'm not sure that I've even told you. Yeah, <laughs> Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, February 1996. Now, the internet has been around for a very long time, but it really only burst into public consciousness in the mid 90s when the, the web arrived 
And we had this huge explosion of excitement amongst cyber libertarians like uh, the late John Perry Barlow, who actually his day job was that he was the, uh, was he the drummer or some, some participant in, the, in a band called the Grateful Dead. And um, he had, oh, he's a cattle rancher as well. He had various interests, but one of them was that he was a famous cyber libertarian. Now, um, I, I never agreed with that. Uh, I've been working on computer law since 1982 and on regulation of the internet since um, just a couple of years before that statement was made. And so uh, a couple of papers that um, I was involved with in 95 and 96, sadly I hadn't sent the 95 one to John Perry Barlow before he wrote that, but uh, my view has been actually nothing in the history of the world has been as massively regulated, uh, arguably over-regulated, as activities that take place quotes online. And there's debates about does cyberspace exist? Is it a place? What does online mean? That's for another day. But the fact is, if you do stuff via the internet or um, on uh, infrastructure that's part of the internet or on media hosted via the internet, then it turns out that there's a, a almost unlimited number of laws and regulations that potentially apply to those activities. And every time a new technology uh, comes along, and the, the latest buzz seems to be, well, it's not the latest actually, but one of the recent buzzes has been blockchain. People say, ah, finally the law is finished. You can't touch us, blockchain is beyond the law. Um, now, reports of the death of sovereignty were in fact uh, exaggerated, and, and Barlow, to his credit, did admit a few years later, uh, we all get older and smarter, when he found that actually there was a lot of regulation going on um, in terms of activities carried on via the internet. And there were some cases that some of you will be familiar with, um, the Nazi memorabilia case in France uh, was a watershed, really, in the exercise of territorial controls over web content, and we're seeing that more and more now around the world. And indeed, for some people, that's, that's actually uh, regrettable. Now, you might say, in that case, it's a good thing that it was regulated, but once you start to balkanize or carve up the internet, and you start to say, well, here's the Chinese version of the internet, and it has only content that's approved by the Chinese authority, and here's the Russian version, and here's the whatever version, that is actually arguably regrettable in terms of freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and the ability of people to learn um, what's going on around the world. Uh, there's lots of literature on this. That's one of the books, if you're interested, that's worth looking at. Who Controls the Internet? Illusions of a Borderless World. Um, and these days, for various reasons, including regulated content, but also intellectual property protection and various other reasons, there's lots of use of geolocation technologies, uh, for various reasons, including filtering and censorship by quite a lot of governments uh, around the world and, and various regulators. Um, but taxation, there's always money somewhere in here. There are reasons why people want to know uh, what's happening where and apply their own laws. Um, and specifically in the context of data protection, the, uh, the Google Spain or Costea case, which really launched this whole debate about the so-called right to be forgotten, and I say so-called because there are lots of problems with it, which again are probably for another discussion. Um, that demonstrated the long arm reach of European data protection laws. In that case, the Court of Justice of the European Union accepted that Google Inc. ran the Google search engine from California and it ran it for the whole world. However, they were really keen to regulate Google in Spain. And so they said, well, but you've got this subsidiary that sells AdWords and you make money out of that. Therefore, uh, we will deem you to be established for data protection purposes, not necessarily the same as established for other purposes like tax, but you're deemed to be established for data protection purposes in Spain, and therefore Spanish data protection law applies and we can force you to delist certain uh, items in search results uh, because they're contrary to Spanish data protection law. So that's the, the background context very briefly on why blockchain is highly likely to end up uh, and indeed it already is, in my opinion, being heavily regulated. Uh, but there are some interesting characteristics about blockchain that make it difficult to apply existing laws to it. So there's lots of regulation of online activities, and regulation hasn't killed the internet. But can blockchain play nicely with GDPR? Uh, so what happens if we try to apply the rules about controllers and processors and lawful basis for processing and the data subject rights to access and erasure and all that kind of stuff. Can you really apply that all to GDPR? And this is a, a, a sort of rework to take on Munch's silent screen. Uh, why do you get that look whenever we talk about GDPR compliance? And um, I, I've been getting that look a lot actually in the last uh, five years. But uh, I think most people are over the initial shock and they're now trying to 
to work out the more nuanced applications, and they're starting to see real uh, enforcement action in various countries and significant fines or significant uh, notices of intended um, fines, shall we say, in the UK and some other countries. So let's look briefly at where there's tension between blockchain and the way blockchains are deployed, including the example that John has given us, and um, data protection law. Now, here's the quote I said I would give you uh, from a, um, a legislator. Certain technologies will not be compatible with GDPR if they don't provide for the exercise of data subject rights based on their architectural design. This does not mean that blockchain technology in general has to adapt to the GDPR. It just means it probably can't be used for the processing of personal data. Oh, okay. Bad news. Uh, sorry about that, John. Um, who, who said that? Ah, right. That was uh, Jan Philip Albrecht, who was the uh, MEP who chaired the Lieber Committee that um, was heavily involved in the development of GDPR in the European Parliament. And he's since gone back to uh, Germany, but for many years he was extremely influential in the development of data protection law in the EU, and ultimately that's had a ripple effect um, around the world. So his theory was, um, you can use blockchain if you like, but you probably can't use it to process personal data. So um, I want to go back to basics and very briefly uh, recap some of the things you've already heard from John, but put them into the context of um, data protection. So the way I see it, although there's, you know, there's, there's plenty of much more complex explanations than this out there, I'm sure John could, well, he, he's going to field any technical questions, and we've agreed that already. But basically, for me, blockchain has three essential characteristics. It's a way of recording um, items of information, like transactions in digital tokens like a cryptocurrency, but equally it could be the contents of an archive, we just heard about that. Secondly, you use cryptography to make it difficult to tamper. Now here I slightly take exception, but you know, I'm a pedantic lawyer, to the words that John's been using. He says it's tamper-proof. I don't think it's tamper-proof, I think it's tamper-evident. So the, the, the beauty of blockchain is if anybody messes with anything anywhere in the chain, you can see it because it affects everything else down the line. But it doesn't, strictly speaking, stop somebody trying to mess with a record. It's just you can tell they've messed with it. Okay, I think we can agree on that, good. Um, and thirdly, uh, you have an agreed process for storing copies of the ledger and adding new ledger entries. Now, again, as, as John has helped, for, helped for explain already, in the case of something like Bitcoin, you use um, what's called proof of work, where in that case you have miners who have to solve these increasingly complex mathematical puzzles using masses of energy and other resources and extremely slow and controversial and not, in my, my understanding, scalable or sustainable in any sense of the word. But that's the model they use. And then there are other models, um, such as you would find in a more controlled environment like the international uh, sharing of archival um, records, and there's, there's many in between. By the way, there's a lot of serious commercial developments in this field, and uh, many uh, governments and financial institutions and other organizations are spending a lot of money building and deploying uh, their own blockchains. And I'll, I'll try and explain um, in a minute how that works. Now, this is, this is really something that's been covered already, the idea that each block is hashed, and the hash becomes um, the, the header for the next block, and then the header for this block is the hash of the previous block, and so on. And that's why if you mess with any of the content here, you find that subsequent blocks down the line uh, they don't add up, basically, putting very crudely in non-mathematical terms, and you can see that the chain has been tampered with. But let's look a bit at how these might be deployed. Now, the example we've had from, from John is a little bit like this first one here. This happens to be a banking consortium, and it won't be three banks, it might be 300 banks or 3,000 banks, but it's a closed user group of known participants who pretty much trust each other, they don't completely trust each other, but they can actually set up a contractual arrangement uh, for dealing with their transaction data, and they can share that via um, a blockchain. And that, that's called a permissioned blockchain. You have to be a bank, and you have to be invited to join the club, and you have to sign the contract. Contrast that to an open model, uh, which is also known sometimes as permissionless, like Bitcoin, where anybody, any of us here in this room, could become a Bitcoin node, so we could hold a copy of the Bitcoin ledger, or we could become a miner, and we could uh, actually engage in this puzzle-solving 
um, business to try and earn bits of Bitcoin as a reward. Now, last uh, there is a site you can go. I had a look this afternoon. The last count of 9,444 um, uh, nodes, I think, in, in Bitcoin, and that fluctuates a bit around the 10,000 mark. But there's a lot of copies. Uh, uh, so, and then, would that be nodes or miners? I may be getting my jargon mixed up here. Notes. Okay, notes. Right. But uh, any any of us, if we want, we can get a copy of this uh, ledger for what it's worth. Now. Uh, think about the, the implications, though, the legal implications of these different models. If you have a trusted third party, and uh, this is even simpler than the five or however many years archives you have around the world. Here, you might have something like a land registry in a particular country, which is the master copy. And arguably, this is not blockchain at all because it's not a distributed ledger. But actually, people do use blockchain uh, these days to cover arrangements that are not distributed, they just use the underlying technologies of hashing uh, the records and then using the hash as the header for the next um, uh, block and so on. And you can build a chain with any number of participants, starting with one, arguably. Um, now contrast that extreme case, again, to something massively distributed like the, the Bitcoin um, nodes, where you uh, you don't know who all these people are, you certainly don't trust them all, and um, you have to think, how on earth are we going to, to manage this in terms of concepts like who is the controller for data protection purposes, who is the processor, who is uh, responsible for um, complying with uh, the, the obligations, say, under GDPR in terms of dealing with regulators, in terms of dealing with individual data subjects, um, and uh, who's liable uh, you know, if somebody tries to enforce the law against any participant. And uh, some of the specific GDPR challenges that we've looked at in our research are, well, is everybody with a copy of the ledger in one of these distributed arrangements a data controller or a data processor or possibly both? And indeed, uh, to make it more complicated, some of you will be familiar with recent um, jurisprudence from the Court of Justice to do with joint controllers of data, and there are several uh, significant cases, probably for this purpose the most significant are the Vershaft Academy case and the Fashion ID case, where it seems that uh, there'll be many more joint controller situations than we previously thought, and so somebody who just has, say, uh, a plugin from Facebook um, on their website may find that they are a joint controller with Facebook for certain purposes. Um, just because when somebody visits that web page, some data is automatically sent to Facebook. Even if you don't click on the like button or you don't click on the Facebook button, you can find there's a joint control situation. And it's very complicated because when you read these judgments, which are not terribly transparent, it looks like you can be a joint controller one moment and then not a joint controller or maybe not a controller at all the next moment. And they talk about the um, communication of data in the instant that somebody lands on a page and it gets sent off to Facebook. Now, if you just imagine trying to apply that to a distributed ledger model with maybe hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of participants, it becomes very uh, tricky. Um, are there any uh, trusted third parties or intermediary service providers? And if so, are they controllers? Are they processors? For example, um, BAS, which is blockchain as a service. As you know, you can have anything as a service these days. That's the beauty of cloud computing. And there is a thing out there, well established, all the big um, enterprise cloud providers offer it called blockchain as a service. And again, some people will say, well, that's not really blockchain because they're actually running this thing in the cloud. But it is a kind of alternative to this consensus mechanism. You're basically trusting IBM or Microsoft or Amazon or Google or whoever to keep the ledger and to, to manage the security and the integrity of the ledger. Um, and that is one model actually that, that I think could become quite popular. Um, but you have to think, are they controllers? Are they processors? Uh, well, I think they're almost certainly gonna be processors, but on some of the recent case law, it suggests they might even become controllers for certain purposes. If they're processors, who's gonna give them instructions? Because again, those of you familiar with GDPR and um, things like the UK <coughs> Protection Act, uh, 2018 will know that there are very, very detailed rules um, in terms of what has to go into contracts between controllers and processors. And setting up those contracts, um, it's all very well in theory if you've got two businesses or a government and a business entering into a control and processor relationship, but most arrangements in the world are not like that. And so interestingly, after 
the, the Fashion ID um, judgment um, and the Verschaft Academy case, uh, Facebook actually changed its practices pretty quickly and there's an addendum to its terms of service which spells out in what circumstances uh, a user of Facebook is a joint controller with Facebook but then the fiction kind of, it gets a bit complicated because in theory, the individual user should give instructions to Facebook on how to process the data. And that's not really scalable if you've got 2.7 billion users or whatever it is, met, you know, people on Facebook. So they basically say, and you are giving us these instructions. Uh, and I will tell you if you change the instructions to us. Well, that's nice to know. So this is the kind of legal fiction you quickly get into when you apply GDPR to large scale uh, distributed arrangements like that. Um, how can data subject rights, especially to have uh, the record corrected or rectified or erased, including the so-called rights we've forgotten, how can that work for an immutable ledger? Now again, coming back to this earlier nuance between uh, is it tamper proof or is it tamper evident? Actually, you can change the chain. You can even change it by agreement, by consensus. But the ways you do that are quite cumbersome at the moment. You might fork the chain, that's happened with Ethereum, um, but you can't really, you can't do that on a frequent basis or the whole thing becomes unworkable. Um, and then you get into disputes as which is the authentic or definitive chain uh, and so on. But there are some technologies now which sound like a contradiction in terms actually. So um, Accenture's been working on an editable blockchain model. I don't know whether you've looked at that, which kind of is an, a contradiction in terms if it's supposed to be a hash record that is at least, um, you can see if somebody has changed it. But it may be that there will be controls uh, built around blockchains in certain uh, controlled environments, permissioned closed user group type environments, whereby you might be able to, by agreement, change the records, but still have a, a, a really precise record of what's, what's happened in the change process. Um, is the proliferation of copies in a distributed ledger technology model compatible with the data minimization requirements in GDPR? which you should only keep as much data as, as necessary for the purpose, and you should only keep it for so long as necessary. Now, National Archives have some helpful exemptions here, so you can keep stuff forever in certain cases, but normal people who are not you know, are covered by the archive rules, uh, you do have to think, am I keeping only as much data as are necessary for this purpose, for this duration of time? And that's quite problematic, uh, in theory at least, if the idea is to keep uh, an immutable, record forever. Okay. Um, must you assume, uh, this is another whole topic, so I'm not going to go into this, that the data in a blockchain distributed ledger model are actually processed anywhere in the world? Because indeed, even on that, that uh, controlled environment, the, the, the pilot project you described, you've got five um, archives in different countries, you're talking about international data transfers of large volumes of personal data, and you need uh, a legal basis for that too. Um, but what happens if you, if you extrapolate that into a much larger group, particularly when you get into these so-called permissionless models? It's quite difficult to see how you comply with the data transfer rules. So, I'm going to wrap up. Is GDPR compliance uh, really impossible, as uh, Jan uh, Philip Albrecht claimed? If you, he said basically you probably can't put personal data onto a blockchain. Um, I'm not sure about that. In fact, I am sure it, it, it is possible. but. Typical lawyer's um, response is, it depends. Yes, okay. Uh, so you go to talk to any barrister or law firm in the city, and you come up with your really interesting question. And they'll, they'll pause for a while, pour you another cup of coffee, and say, it depends. And it really does depend in this case. Um, for a start, what do you mean by blockchain? And as we've just discussed, there are many different models for blockchain, and many different ways of deploying blockchain, and for establishing relationships between all the different actors in a uh, distributed or not so distributed ledger technology environment. Is it public, um, like Bitcoin, or is it private, like your archival example we had earlier? Is it permissionless, again, like Bitcoin, or permissioned, like your model? Um, are you dealing with um, anonymous participants? Are you dealing with anonymous data? Uh, or are they identifiable? There's another big debate about um, anonymization versus pseudonymization and reversible um, anonymization, which again sounds like a contradiction in terms. So that again is for another another day. Is it decentralized or at least partly centralized? So is there some trusted party uh, like the land registry or some trusted third party uh, like one of these blockchain as a service cloud providers in, in the loop? 
because that may actually help you a great deal in terms of GDPR compliance, because you know who to contract with and you know what the basic uh, rules of the game will be. Um, is it trustless, uh, like something like Bitcoin, or does it involve trust and trusted third parties with clearly agreed rules? Is it built on third party services? And if so, um, how do they control the environments, including the contractual arrangements between all the participants in a particular blockchain um, scenario? And this is the critical one. This is what I'd love to have a discussion about, actually. And you've already touched on this. Uh, what is actually on the blockchain? And you've said, well, you can't stick the whole video on there. It's too big. So you make this fingerprint, um, which it turns out, I mean, you, the data you've given us is extremely impressive. Three seconds or whatever it is mm -hmm. out of a very long uh, HD movie is extraordinary if that's all it takes in terms of a change for you to see, um, subject to the false positive discussion, to see that somebody's messed with it. Um, but one of the problems that we found, and we've looked at lots of potential and real world use cases that people are trying to build, is there's a real problem with um, provenance and trust at the borderline between off-chain and on-chain. So for example, some people have said, why don't we use blockchain as a way of tracking the provenance of valuable things like diamonds, or maybe tracking the provenance of things that you really want to make sure they're not counterfeit, like certain uh, drugs, for example, certain medication products. The problem is you have to trust somebody at the point when they're looking at the diamond or they're in the factory where they're, you know, they're manufacturing the pharmaceutical product. And that's where th there's, a, there's a trust um, deficit, arguably. Uh, and so all the models we've seen, including container shipping, tracking models using blockchain, and that's actually been built at the moment, you still have to trust somebody, <coughs> say in that case, in the port, in a particular country. Um, have they looked in the container? Is it, has it got anything in it? Is it full of water? Is the stuff damaged? Um, you have to trust humans a lot. So when people talk about this immutable, um, even your tamper evident record, or tamper proof record, if you want to call it that, uh, you're still trusting people who put the stuff into the record in the first place. And that's something we could perhaps explore a bit in the context of what you do in the National um, Archive. So, uh, it, GDPR and blockchain, compatible or incompatible codes, it depends, but maybe we can find a way to solve this particular puzzle. And if you want to read more about this, I've given you this last one, which is the four-page sort of teaser. Uh, this one um, is 106 pages in an American journal, although all of these papers are available for free download on the Social Science Research Network, SSRN. Um, I had the privilege of working with computer scientists at the uh, computer lab at the University of Cambridge. We've been collaborating with them now for six years on various projects. We spent a whole year working on blockchain a few years ago, and so uh, they have been involved in co-authoring these um, first two papers. This third paper, uh, lead author is my colleague Chris Reed, who some of you know, looks at this problem of the, the borderline between off-chain and on-chain assets, and he calls that legal impurities and off-chain assets. So there are limits to what you can do in terms of having a record that you can trust using blockchain, because you've got to think about how stuff gets on the blockchain in the first place. And that's all I wanted to say. Thanks very much.